Anti-lag is epic. Just listen to this. That is the sound of fuel deliberately being burnt in the exhaust in order to keep the turbo creating boost all the time. But back in the early 2000s, Subaru took an already incredible system and stepped it up, creating a kind of jet engine that sat in the exhaust, meaning it created more power and dominated rallying at the time. But how did this mad contraption work? Anti-lag is actually remarkably simple. It's about sticking a load of energy through the turbo in order to reduce the lag. But why was this so important in rallying? Because you don't often see this in traditional circuit racing. Well, it came down to the rules at the time. All cars had to stick to a maximum of two liter engines, but the turbos were fairly unrestricted. So racing being racing, they all bolted on the biggest turbos they could find. So many of them were running upward of two bar of boost and creating up to 400 horsepower from their engines. But with power figures climbing, the FIA brought in one rule to limit horsepower. They didn't want things getting out of a hand, a bit like they did in the Group B era. Those cars were absolutely crazy. You can check that video out up here. Anyway, they brought in a rule to stop this. They had to run turbo restrictor plates, a plate on the intake of the turbo, limiting the amount of air the turbo could suck in. This doesn't hurt that much at the lower RPMs, but as you get to engine speeds upwards of 5,000 RPM, this restriction really limits power, meaning that all of the teams were running about 300 horsepower. In the early 2000s, these plates had a very precise size 34 millimeter hole and that was the same for every car but there was another problem this created turbo lag now don't get me wrong even without these restrictor plates turbos of this side would have a fair amount of lag but the restriction really meant that the turbo had to work harder to get the air in and create the boost so as it always goes in motorsport the teams got creative. Firstly, Lancia came up with a clever idea. It didn't solve the problem, but it sort of enabled them to get around it. They twin charged their engines, meaning they had a supercharger and a turbocharger, meaning that the supercharger supplied boost at low RPM, and then the turbo then provided boost at the high RPM. It was all very clever, but they still had some of the drawbacks of both systems. The supercharger was a drag on the engine and the turbo limited exhaust flow, not to mention the extra weight of running both systems. So Toyota Toyota came up with another idea. They stole an idea from Formula One turbo engines of the 80s, where Renault, Ferrari, and BMW were using the exhaust to burn fuel and spin the turbo, even when the driver was off the throttle. And this was super clever at the time. So imagine you're driving into a corner, you lift off the throttle, drive the car through the corner, and then when you stamp on the throttle, you still have to wait for the turbo to spin up and deliver its peak power. And that's not ideal, especially in rallying, where stages are tight and twisted and unpredictable and not having that immediate throttle response will add up to seconds over a stage. Now recently there was the F1 summer break, meaning there was no F1 to watch, but there is racing going on all around the globe. However, you can't always watch it. Much of it is blocked so you have to be in the right location to watch it. So what did they do about this turbo lag? They played with the ECU, meaning that when the driver lifted they shut the throttle valve, but not fully like you'd normally expect. Instead they let some air and a load of fuel through the engine when the driver was off the throttle. Then they would retard the ignition, meaning that the spark plug fired really late. So late that the exhaust valve was already open, meaning that the combustion didn't create much compression. It fired out the exhaust port. This super high energy pulse would fly through the exhaust and into the turbo, spinning it up. And as a byproduct, you get insanely loud pops from the exhaust. Oh, and flames. Don't forget the flames. So when the driver stamps on the throttle, the turbo is already creating peak boost. You can hear this here, just listen. Before the launch, you can hear the boost already being created. And one thing to note here is that there were no mechanical changes needed. All the engineers needed to change was the engine map. Now we know how cool this system is and how epic the sound of these cars were, but did it work? Well, look at this dyno graph from Subaru. Here the car is running without ALS and with. The difference in power is mad, but the difference in torque is incredible. The drivers must have felt a massive difference in punch out of the corners. Now, this was revolutionary, but it came with its drawbacks. As you can imagine, this meant the cars drank through fuel, meaning that you had to carry a bit more fuel load through the rally. Then there was reliability. This pulse of exhaust gas is often hot enough to melt the turbos. Exhaust manifolds would glow red and the designers had to be really careful not to melt important electronics inside the engine bay. 
And the final drawback was on drivability and the brakes. And yes, I know that does sound unusual. This was down to the fact that the system removes all engine braking, as you're actually still firing the engine, even when the driver is totally off the throttle. So for the drivers, this made things a little bit difficult. For example, in a quick corner, rather than braking, you might just lift off the throttle, letting the drivetrain and the engine apply a subtle braking force to move the weight forward and help you turn the car into the corner. And this was all gone in the cars, meaning the drivers had to use the brakes a lot more, meaning that the car was more difficult to drive and it ate through brakes. So the teams began improving this, all aiming at making the cars more drivable and more reliable. And this culminated in the Toyota team coming up with a different solution to the anti-lag problem. It was called Fresh Air Anti-Lag or Secondary Injection Anti-Lag. So Toyota took some of the intake air and routed it through a valve into the exhaust. This meant the combustion in the exhaust was cleaner, cooler and more efficient, essentially meaning they ate through fewer turbos per season. And that valve was important. It allowed the ECU to control exactly how much boost the car was producing off throttle, meaning Toyota could be much more precise with its anti-lag system, resulting in lower fuel consumption, better turbo life, it still wasn't great, and improved drivability. Now, although this was effective, the ProDrive Subaru team thought they could do it better. And how they came up with this, we will never know. It was called the Rocket Exhaust. And with a name like that, it's of course incredible. They essentially made a genius but weird looking device that would do anti-lag but better. They wanted more turbo life, more efficient combustion and a more controlled flow into the turbo. And to be honest with you, it's actually super complex. But ProDrive actually painted it. Patented. So we now know how it works. So this is the rocket or Subaru's external combustion device. And how mad does that sound? It sits between the engine and the turbo. And like the Toyota anti-lag system, it has an inlet of fresh compressed air here controlled by a valve. But the difference here is that the exhaust flow isn't ignited by the spark plug. The rocket does that part. And that's because it's very similar to the combustion chamber in a jet engine. Now, the rocket is a complex shape. All of the tiny details are there for a very good reason. The exhaust flow comes in here and the fresh turbocharged air comes in here. The air flows through all of these small holes into the main combustion chamber. And the main aim of this whole thing is to burn the fuel as efficiently and as cleanly as possible. So the rich air and fuel mixture comes in and the sheer heat in the rocket ignites it. The rocket was made from precision engineered Inconel, a material that has an incredibly high melting point. Now, all of these holes and inlets are to get the fresh air in and mix in with the exhaust gases, meaning they can combust efficiently. Remember, that is Subaru's goal here, a high velocity, consistent flow of gas into the turbo. Now notice these tiny tubes here. They're the inlets for the turbocharged air that create what's called toroidal vortices. Toroidal. Through the rocket. And you might think that you don't know what these things are, but you do. Remember these air Zuka toys? Well, it actually just works like that. With a donut of air traveling through the rocket, creating a perfect environment for the fuel and air to burn, creating a super consistent flow of high energy pulses into the turbo. It's absolutely genius, but there were extra benefits as well. Notice the thin chambers around the outside of the rocket. These actually insulated the outside of the rocket from the 700 degree internal temperatures, meaning the engine bay temperatures were much lower. Then because the combustion was so efficient and mixed well with the fresh air, temperatures through the turbo were lower than traditional anti-lag systems. Where traditional anti-lag systems create intermittent, super high energy combustions, the rocket systems created a steady controlled stream of high energy pulses, meaning the turbo could be spun faster with more control from the ECU, with less heat and less wet. But despite the power and efficiency advantage, the Subaru team didn't manage to beat Sebastian Loeb and Citroen to the title. A little like the battle between the Audi Quattro and the Peugeot T16. The Citroen just had a shorter wheelbase and was more balanced, leading it to winning overall. Now rallying was crazy in the 2000s, but it was more crazy in the 1980s, with the Group B cars and in insanely brave fans lining the stages. You can check our video about that just here. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.